hello, hello. Welcome back to World War One TV with me, Lucy Betteridge Dyson. How are we all? Good to see some of our regulars here. Isn't that nice to say? Honestly, it fills me with joy every time. Um, something a bit different this evening. Um, I feel like we've had a, a really cool mix of shows so far, and tonight we are um, talking about a subject which I'm. I think it's one of the first things I got really interested in, actually, um, when I first came to studying and, you know, just getting into the First World War. Um, for me personally, it was going to the battlefield and visiting the Commonwealth Wargrave Commission cemeteries. That was something that just, um, it just triggered something in me. Um, and so I went away and read up quite a lot on the organisation. Um, and to this day, I am fascinated with visiting the places, no matter how big or small they are. Um, and yeah, it, I, it's like Pokemon. Like I want to catch them all. I want to go to every Wargrave Commission Cemetery because I feel like I want to say, I want to say hello to all of those guys and girls that are there. You know, like I want to pay my respects to as many as possible. And each place is so individual as well. I'm sure like uh, you guys have visited them because of course it's the first world war and the second world war that the Wargrave commission look after um and so you'll know that very special feeling and um, that these places have uh thank you lisa yes you uh, a theme for me is that my hair will change on a regular basis if you don't know me um that that does happen for a very very long time i had orange hair but we're going to sound a bit different today right enough of me babbling on um let's introduce our guest for this evening um it's um uh, uh, actually someone I've known for, for some time been fortunate enough to know her followed her career um, and it's a pleasure to welcome our historian Dr Megan Kelleher. Megan hello. Hi how are you doing Lucy and I'm just agreeing with everyone in the chat uh, complimenting your hair this evening. <laughs> oh thank you um, I'm so glad that you can join us tonight Um I guess before we start um, tell us a bit about what got you interested in the Wargrave Commission because your thesis was kind of based around them wasn't it for your PhD? Yeah, so it was a bit of a mixed bag. And when you were talking about your connections, it was definitely the same thing for me. Um, it's kind of always been that family law of remembering people that you've lost. And my great grandmother lost her dad um, two months before she was born, and he's buried in a Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemetery. So I was aware of them without being aware of them as an organisation, if that makes sense. Uh, did the classic battlefields trips um, when I was at university, so I was actually quite late to doing that school battlefield trip. Um, and I got to visit that grave, which I think I was the first in my family to possibly go and visit him. Wow. Um, and then it kind of expanded from there. I started specialising in the First and Second World War um, and then wanted to learn a bit more. I became an, an, an intern at the time. It's now called the Guides Programme uh, during 2018 for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And I started getting lots of questions when I came back to the UK about why war graves are in the UK. And then I did the classic thing like you of wanting to catch them all and thought maybe rather naively hopefully not that uh, I could just find the answer in a thesis for a PhD I know that the answer is that I didn't find all of the answers in my PhD thesis but it was a good starting point to get some of those questions and raise even more for me really yeah amazing I should say Dr Megan Kelleher um, so, <laughs> I, I, I'm looking forward to reading your thesis at some point for sure um, and and yeah, I mean, like you say, like it's that often that personal connection that drives us to uh, all of the things that we get interested in with with uh, the first and second world war, isn't it? Um, well, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand over to you. I'll bring up your presentation. Look at that. Hopefully, the check is on our side this evening for once. Third time lucky, eh? Um, and yeah, I'll hand it to you. And you know, questions, uh, get them in, guys, and, and we'll have questions as we go along tonight. Um, why not? Yeah, and uh, just to say that the format of this evening is going to be probably slightly different from the previous couple of um, presentations, just because I'm very aware that Lucy is prolific on social media for sharing some of the stories that she comes across. And I'm very aware that I'm among people who visit these sites um, all of the time. And I can see that Ian has put in the chat that he likes walking to the second back row of the cemetery where they're slightly less visited. And so please do feel free to keep telling me about these as we go along. I'm going to um, talk a bit more about the First World War Dead, um, specifically by the War Graves Commission. Um, I've decided to call it the War Graves Commission as opposed to Commonwealth and Imperial, um, because the name changed in 1960, just so that we don't get confused um, as well. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, Lucy. 
Um, so the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, as it's known today, uh, commemorates the war dead for the British Empire forces as they were at the time, now British and Commonwealth war dead, of the two world wars. And they do this in more than 150 countries and territories at more than 23,000 locations worldwide. And they care for over 1.7 million uh, service men and women. Now, they're funded by six member governments, and the member governments are Australia, Canada, India, New Zealand, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. And the way that they do this is that each nation pays an amount that's based on the proportion of burials for each of their national forces. Now, the United Kingdom government pays about 78% of that budget, and India um, pays the smallest amount. But that's not because India didn't contribute a significant number of war dead. Like I say, it's to do with burials. Um, so commemorations on memorials don't count towards that percentage of the funding. Uh, the Indian financial contribution is so low versus their number of national forces that fought and died because most of their dead were cremated in accordance with their faith or they have no known grave. And I should also point out some terminology in relation to nationality, because um, it's not necessarily the country of birth or um, naturalisation that that individual's from. In commission terms, it relates to the member government uh, that pays for the commemoration, which is in turn based on the association of the unit or regiment that that individual served with. So you might find that someone emigrated to Canada but wasn't formally a citizen, but is listed as Canadian. Um, and I will say that for every rule, there's an exception with a lot of different things. And I'll try and highlight some of those as we go along as well. I feel like that's the thing with the War Grave Commission. For every rule, there's at least one exception. It's more of a guideline, should we be honest? Exactly. And it's quite it's quite nice when you find those exceptions as well, because it highlights to you that there's so much variety in these stories. Yeah, definitely. And also just this idea as well that you know this was a, a new organization with the first world war that was set up and it was still figuring things out at that stage I guess. Yeah definitely and I, I will touch a little bit on the second world war and compare it to the first a little bit later on um, but you're absolutely right um, if we move on to the next slide um, I'll show you a bit more about the founding of the War Graves Commission. So the chap on the screen is Sir Fabian Ware, and he is the founder of that organisation that is now known as the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Um, and I should go back in time a little bit. So prior to the First World War, uh, the common soldier and sailor could expect little in terms of that death commemoration. So graves might be unmarked or untended, and little, if anything, was recorded at the time. Um, but this changes because of Fabian Ware. Uh, he was too old to fight in the First World War, so he became a commander of a mobile unit of the British Red Cross, and he became really concerned that the final resting places um, would be lost forever. And so he and his unit actually began recording all the graves that they could find. Um, and he is a really tenacious individual, and he uses his contacts. Uh, he used to work as a former journalist in the variety of roles that he has. Um, and he starts speaking to the War Office. And in 1915, they're given a, a official recognition as the director of the Graves Registration and Inquiries. And then it's formally established as the Imperial War Graves Commission by Royal Charter by the 21st of May, 1917. And Fa Fabian Ware serves as the vice chairman, while His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales at the time serves as the president. Uh, the name changes to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission in 1960. Um, but to give you a bit of perspective of within the space of a year, by 1918, they had 587,000 identified and 559 dead with no known grave being registered. That's um, crazy within, ju within just that period. Yeah, sorry, I should say 559,000. <laughs> that, that, um, but crazy. yeah. It's, it's madness how this all comes together um, in such a, a wonderful way. Um, but we've got to remember it's still uh, a really new organisation that's going on. Um, and then if we move on to the next slide, I'll show you some of the early years of the Commission's work. Um, and I want to highlight the quote from Rudyard Kipling. So I'm aware that Lucy very much frequents Bateman's and, and that area. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, and if you are in the area, again, Lucy has shared on social media the memorial crosses that are in the nearby church, uh, aren't they, Lucy? Yeah, I, I, for anybody who doesn't know, I, I, Rudyard Kipling is one of my historical fascinations um, and I live very close to his, his home Bateman's, it's a National Trust property, um, and the little village, our little village, Burwash, um, has a, a number of original First World War 
uh, grave markers sort of in the entrance to the to the church. Um, you find these quite a lot in the UK, actually, um, and they tend to make their way to churches, I guess, because that was a, a community hub um, at the time. And they're yeah, just so sobering seeing those original markers. Yeah. And Rudyard Kipling obviously has that commission uh, connection because he was the official literary advisor from 1917 uh, until, his, until his death, excuse me, in 1936. Um, and he or he highlights as well that the sing it's the work that the commission does is it's the single biggest piece of work since the pharaohs and they only worked in their own country is how he describes it when, when he's reflecting upon it because they're dealing with different countries they have new states being formed that they have to negotiate with they're speaking to families from a uk perspective and dealing with the moral and legal obligations there um so there's lots of things going on um and Many of the individuals who died in the First World War were formally laid to rest after the armistice as the battlefields were searched and cleared, which is what the image on the left hand side of my screen is, which has a group of soldiers out on the battlefields um, with shovels and things like that. And what I love about this as well, um, as a complete aside, is that this helps to create those Anglo-Belgian and Anglo-French connections, particularly that we see. Um, so in places like Ypres, where now today we might go to Ypres Burger and other places uh, after visiting the battlefields. Um, but Monday to Friday, these individuals would be out on the battlefields, clearing them. And then on Saturday and Sunday, they'd be out enjoying themselves as, as the people that they were. And then you create those uh, marriages and children and things like that that occur in the interwar period. Um, but we also have thousands of small cemeteries and isolated battlefield burials found across the landscape, which is like what we're seeing here. Um, and there was a decision to concentrate isolated graves and many of the smaller cemeteries to create those newer cemeteries that could be properly tended to. And we can see an example of that to the my right hand side of the screen, which shows a padre and a group of troops laying to rest some people. Um, and I believe that this is a group of Maori troops that are laying to rest their officer. Um, but I can double check that as well. Um, yeah, they're, they're wonderful photos. I, uh, I, these old photos of, of sort of the creation of the cemeteries um, are just so fascinating, I find. And, you know, the, the fact that obviously uh, bringing in those individual, those sort of isolated graves into those concentrations for those bigger cemeteries, was that, you know, was that in any way controversial sort of moving those or was that just sort of ex everybody accepted that was the best thing to do? I think it's it's kind of a mix of, of opinions because um, particularly certain religious groups might uh, object to people being exhumed and wanting people to lie at rest where they fell. Um, but there's also this wider conception of the time. We need to remember it's the turn of the century and the Victorian period. And a lot of things like uh, multiple occupancy graves are quite commonplace, particularly for uh, the slightly uh, more working classes and lower classes. Um, so there's not objections to that specifically. There are objections to things like not allowing repatriation and private memorials and things like that. They kind of take the focus of um, the the what then becomes the 1920 parliamentary debate. Um, and I find that really interesting because, yeah, out of all of those things, it's it's not something that comes up as frequently. Mm, yeah, no, definitely. And I'm sure you're going to come on to this. Phil's got a question about the sort of who decided on the standard form of, of the graves. And that's something you're going to be coming on to. I don't want to jump ahead, Megan. Yeah, yeah, that's something we're going to be coming along to. Um, oh. And that was decided just a short version of in the meeting minutes, um, which are all available to access for free online if you are interested, um, because the commission has its own archive and a lot of the meeting minutes have them there. Um, but there are lots of different designs that you can see on there where they're sort of working towards them. Um, there's a debate about having a cross shape. So if you've been to American Battlefield Monuments Commission cemeteries, you'll see the crosses like in St. Private Ryan. There's a debate whether they did something similar to that, um, which ultimately they decide against because it would highlight people from a non-Christian background and there's this idea of equality and death going on. Um, so that's how it kind of comes to be. But there's definitely debates. Um, one of the biggest ones is um, Lord Cecil writes about the fact that they're not using a cruciform uh, headstone and there's a lot of sassy emails, uh, sassy emails, okay. sassy letters, I would say, is the best way to describe them between each other of turn of the century cutting remarks that I found really interesting to read. Well, I mean, I guess it's one of those, it's just a classic, isn't it? You're never going to please everybody. And at the, the end of the day, 
and I'm sure something that you're going to be mentioning is that one of the key things is this idea that everybody's equal. So with that, the flip side is there's definitely going to be people who are unhappy with things, I guess. Yes. And uh, we'll see a little bit later on some of those. Uh, again, for every rule, there's an exception because I am going to contradict myself. Um a lot of the time because I'll say things and I'll say remember this thing a little bit later on and then hopefully you'll be like hang on a second uh, in the chat <laughs> um, but uh, if we move on to the next slide um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the dates of responsibility um, which is basically the commission couldn't look after all war dead ever from the turn of the 20th century uh, they came up with these dates of responsibility so for the first world war it's individuals of the British Empire forces or recognized auxiliary organizations who died um, in service or as a result of their service between the 4th of August 1914 and the 31st of August 1921 and then for the Second World War it's the 3rd of September 1939 to the 31st of December 1947. Now hopefully people recognise those start dates um, but the end dates as we all know with studying military history finding a definitive date for an end of a conflict can be really tricky. Um, every country might have different opinions. So, for example, uh, some of the states um, in the Baltic area and in Turkey have civil wars straight after the First World War uh, in our terminology. And so they might incorporate those into that. Um, and the end date is decided by um, a discussion in Parliament. And they basically come up with this date to kind of cover people who have died as a result of complications from the um, playing a part in the war and that sort of thing. And then for the Second World War, it's to make sure it's the same duration. Um, so it's a really interesting negotiation that they're having there. Uh, and it also encompasses some of those other things after the First World War that people might be interested in as well and other involvements that the British Army uh, are involved in. Um, I should also caveat as well for recognised auxiliary organisations, sometimes there's additional criteria. Um, and what I mean by auxiliary organisations is things like the women's services that are involved um, and that sort of thing. Sometimes it has to be that they died as a result of active service, um, as opposed to, um, for example, being involved in the Blitz um, and that sort of thing. Um, and then if we move on to the next slide, I'm going to show you, I mentioned about uh, 53,000 locations. Um, hopefully you can see this. This is a map of the world and it shows where the commission has a, uh, a number of cemeteries in and a number of commemorations. So you can see that they operate on all continents of the world except from Antarctica and pretty much every country in the world um, and territory as well. Um, and then I'm going to, if we move on to the next slide, Lucy, you can see the commemorations in Europe. Now, all I'm going to say at this point is just have a look at that number for the United Kingdom and the number of commemorations there, because I'm gonna throw in a little bit of my research a little bit later on, um, but I just want you to note it as a number. <laughs> Noted. Um, just a, a couple of questions have just come in just um, as regards dates and things like that. Um, so um, question here from Terry. So were British personnel who were killed in Ireland and Russia in 1918 to 1921 covered by the Wargrave Commission? Yeah, they were. Um, one example that I've got, and I'm not going to claim credit for this, and my apologies to the volunteer from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission that told me about this. I've forgotten your name, but if you are here, hello. Um, at Bedford Cemetery uh, down in Bedfordshire, there is an individual who died in 1921 uh, in Ireland. Um, and it's a really interesting story. I'm not going to give it away because if you go on one of his tours, you'll find out more. <laughs> but it's, it's a really poignant story about uh, that conflict and and the things that are happening in Ireland after the First World War. Amazing. And then um, another one here just about the Wargrave Commission offering um, long service employees the option to be buried. And I've, I've seen these. I've seen these graves in the cemeteries. I know it's not something that we do now, um, but I can't actually tell you when they did. But I think uh, what we've got to remember at the time, and my apologies, I will find this out and then I'll pop it in the chat uh, after I found it out after the, the live stream, um, is a lot of these individuals are actually veterans themselves. Um, <laughs> and so there is that connection of being buried near to their comrades. Um, and there's also a really interesting book, sorry to jump into the Second World War, uh, by Catli Caitlin ne D'Angelo. Never, never apologise for jumping into the Second World War here. <laughs> Um, but Caitlin D'Angelis is, is releasing a book soon talking about some of the individuals who were commission employees in the Second World War who were interred and uh, and were involved in that sort of thing as well. Um, so I'm very intrigued to read that book. 
And um, just a question here, and people can find this kind of stuff out. It's a question from Terry about wanting to know where the Wargrave Commission uh, grave is that's in the US there. You can find that out by searching on the website. If there's like a record there of everything, um, and because I'm assuming you might not know off the top of your head. Yeah, so there, there's some, uh, I will say that the smallest uh, directly maintained site by the Commission is in uh, the US, it's on Ocracoke Island, uh, and my apologies if I've mispronounced that, um, and it has four um, burials there, but I can again pop in the chat a little bit later on, you can find cemeteries and memorials um, for free, find war dead as well, and you can research and kind of um, manipulate the data to find out particular things that you're interested in amazing thank you i'll let you uh, we'll pick up some more questions in a little while um but i'll let you uh over Ooh. to you <laughs> that's cool um if we move on to the next slide um i'm going to show some familiar sites that i've seen someone talk about Tynecott definitely earlier but that might be because it's one of my favorite sites to look at i am slightly biased at this point and i know it's a very odd thing to say this is my favorite cemetery um because um and just to say james it was okrakoki island is the name of the cemetery um, which I think is in one of the Carolinas, um, but my geography is terrible. <laughs> uh, but Tynecott Cemetery and Memorial in Belgium is actually where my uh, interest really came to grow with the commission because I actually spent four months uh, working out there when I was an intern. Um, but this is uh, the site that was designed by Sir Herbert Baker and the platform on which you can see the Cross of Sacrifice sitting in that centre uh, was designed by a veteran um, called John uh, Reginald Truelove. Um, and the memorial itself, which is the sort of curved item across the back, it contains around 35,000 names of New Zealand's and British forces. Um, and the British forces are those that are killed in action after the 16th of August 1917 in the Ipsalium. And then the cemetery itself is a concentration cemetery, uh, which contains around 12,000 graves, of which 70% are unknown. And the burials cover all war years from across the Ipsalian. And it, you can kind of see it in this image, but I recommend looking at it um, in your own time as well. Just behind the Cross of Sacrifice, there's slightly more um, higgledy-piggledy uh, war graves, and those are the original battlefield cemetery, whereas all of the manicure bit around it is that concentration site. Um, so these individuals were brought from the battlefields, and the cemetery was built to a particular design. And Jay, how you spelt it is exactly how um, it's written now, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I can see. No, 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 it's, it's wicked. Thank you for helping me out because I'm still getting into the <laughs> juggling questions and, and everything else going on. So, <laughs> um, um, we, did a, we did a little, when we, uh, before we started World War One TV in earnest, we did a very short little live stream from Tynecott. Um, and yeah, it's, I, I don't blame you at all for it being one of your favourite places because it is just stunning. Um, and it's just so interesting as well. Like, every time I go there, I see something new. And it's it's weird because I've, I've been there so, so many times, and yet it's a bit like I get this with Dad's Army, you know, the TV show. Like, I've seen every episode of that series so many times, and then there'll be one on TV, and I'm like, I've never seen that before. <laughs> I go, no, I have. Um, and, yeah, I, I always find that with time. You just get lost there, and then you look at your watch, and you've been there for just hours. Yeah, I still do this now. So, like I say, I was out there five days a week for four months, and I looked at I looked at all of the names. I didn't actually look at all of the names because you need so many days there. Like you say, you'd find a new name and and think about that. Um, and like you said at the start, you kind of want to say hello to everyone yeah. um, and make sure that they are remembered. Um, and I go back uh, to visit some of my friends who still live in Belgium and we'll go, oh, we'll just pop in for a bit. And pop in turns into an afternoon, into early evening, and then you've missed your dinner reservation or something like that. Um, so you can really get lost in in these locations. Not literally, um, they are really well laid out, but in the sense of you get lost in the names and the stories, mm -hmm. the personal inscriptions, and just the beauty of, of the cemetery um, as well. Um, and I can see that lots of people are talking about Tynecott as well. Um, and I can see that John's mentioned uh, that the king wanted the bunkers included in the design. Um, and that's absolutely true. So where those um, quartets of uh, trees are, are two German bunkers. Um, there's also a German bunker underneath the Cross of Sacrifice. And there are two also uh, underneath the memorial today. Um, and these were part of those defensive systems that they went into uh, for the Third Battle of Ypres, which was also known as Passchendaele. Um, and when you go to the site, it really highlights the connection to the battlefields. Um, and I'm sure, Lisa, you've seen countless other sites that are exactly like that as well. Yeah, definitely. I think th those um, 
I mean, and Time Court's interesting because, as you say, you've got the original battlefield cemetery part of it, um, and it, there's just incredible vistas that you get of of that very battlefield when you're looking out because of its location. So, yeah, it's, it's a super special place. Definitely. And then the image on the right, um, I just wanted to highlight is uh, the largest memorial to the missing uh, in terms of commemorations. Uh, and that is the Tietval Memorial in France. And this was designed by Sir Edwin Nutchins. You may recognise his name as uh, fans of the First World War, or people interested in it uh, as designing the cenotaph. Um, and the site contains around 72,000 names of the missing from British and South African forces uh, who died in the Somme sector. And it has in the back, which is where that picture is taken from, it's in the Anglo-French cemetery, which contains 300 British Empire forces and 300 French forces in the cemetery to add to that connection between the French and uh, the British Empire forces, um, particularly during the Battle of the Somme. And uh, if we move on to this one, perfect. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I know that many of us will have seen headstones before, so I haven't quite included them in the slides today. Um, but what I will say is make sure you read the entirety of the headstones, including the personal inscriptions in particular. They are some of the most poignant things that you can read because they are chosen by the families um, and they can really highlight grief and there's different attitudes towards grief. They can be as simple as RIP, um, but they can highlight the real sadness and anger that's being felt by the families and also acknowledging the fighting for king and country and, and that sort of thing. Um, but the other key features that you'll see with insights are that you will generally find a cross of sacrifice in any CWGC cemetery where there are more than 40 burials. And this was designed by Sir Reginald Blomfield. And the stone cross is with a downward sword, which reflects the faith of the majority of those commemorated in the cemetery. Uh, and then on the right, we've got the stone of remembrance, which is usually found in larger cemeteries where there are more than a thousand burials. And it's a symbol for people of all faiths and none. And it's designed by Sir Edwin Nutchins again, and it's carved out of a single piece of Portland stone and is inscribed with words from the Bible that was chosen by Rudyard Kipling, uh, which is their name liveth forevermore. Um, and I think these two symbols are something that you can really look out for in cemeteries. Um, the design as well, they use a um, an architectural feature called entasis. So there's no uh, straight lines as such. So if you stood corner to corner, particularly with that stone of remembrance, you can see it's slightly curved. And this is a, a kind of technical thing that it helps to stop water pooling at the top and weakening the stone, but it also makes it really aesthetically pleasing. Um, and I find that really beautiful when I go into a site. I'm kind of like, wow, when I see that. Yeah, it's, it's, I remember when I first, um, I first heard that and it kind of blew my mind a bit, you know, like it's, <laughs> uh, it's just one of those, because yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a very, very clever uh, architectural um, design, but also, as you say, has a practical purpose. Yeah, and I think as well, if you do stand corner to corner, you will probably see lots of people that do this because myself and uh, my various colleagues um, will talk about this um, and people don't believe you until they do it. And then it's that, oh, OK, um, which is really interesting. And you can also see examples where in the UK, certainly they're incorporated into local war memorial ceremonies and things like that as well. Um, so both Lucy and I are from the same part of the world originally. Uh, and there's a, a cross of sacrifice looking war memorial that's in the Chislehurst sort of area. And that was the first one I saw. So I thought that that was just a war memorial that was placed within a site. But no, it's a, a design feature of commissioned cemeteries. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, I'll send it to you afterwards. <laughs> Um, if we move on to the next slide, Lucy, please. Um, now, I've highlighted that there are a number of people that are missing still, and there's this real idea of equality and death. So everyone should be remembered by name, um, either on a headstone or a memorial that is permanent in its design. But how do you remember someone whose remains aren't physically there? Um, and what they do is they create memorials for missing. And these sites are really impactful as well as the cemeteries. Um, and the one that I've chosen uh, has a personal connection to me. Um, and this is the Ypres Menning Gate Memorial in Belgium. So not only is this a place that many of us will have visited, particularly for the last post ceremony, which happens at eight o'clock every evening, 
Um, it's also a site where one of my relatives is commemorated. Um, and I think he's on panel 20, if I remember. Um, but he was Private Thomas James Kelleher. Uh, and he served with the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry. Uh, and he was 19 when he died. Um, and he was from a large family in southeast London. And he never came home. And I find that story really impactful, not least because it relates to my family directly. And there's over 54,000 names of, of those stories there on the memorial. It was designed by Sir Reginald Blomfield uh, and it has British, Australian, Canadian, South African and Indian forces. And the British forces are pre the 15th of August 1917. So the Tyne Cot Memorial is an extension of that because the number of missing couldn't fit onto the single memorial in the Ipsalium. New Zealanders, please do not panic that I've ignored and overlooked you. I promise you are remembered. New Zealanders are actually commemorated on smaller memorials near to where they fell and fought, um, which is really fascinating. Um, so there's places like the Tynecott Cemetery and Memorial, Butts New British Cemetery and Messines and places like that. But if you go into the Meningate, and I appreciate that someone has just mentioned that uh, the Meningate Memorial is currently closed for renovations, which is true. Um, that there's a little sign that says we were here too and you can find us here basically from New Zealand, which I find really sweet as well. Um, and when this memorial was unveiled, it was unveiled by Field Marshal Plumer uh, to a crowd of widows and other bereaved. Um, and I think it was broadcast on the radio as well. Um, and he quotes a speech that was written for him by Rudyard Kipling. And I think the quote that everyone knows uh, really sums it up, which is he is not missing. He is here. And I think that's a really powerful statement about these memorials because many people want to go out at least once in their lifetime to visit their relatives at this time. It would have been a really expensive journey potentially compared to today, but they've got somewhere to go to rather than no name and, and things like that as well. Um, and Lucy, I don't know if you found that with memorials to the missing as well, the, the impact that they have because they aren't missing, they're there. Um, yeah. That's right. A hundred percent. And I, 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 so I, one topic I find really interesting, which links very, very closely with the, the Wargrave Commission is battlefield tourism. So immediately post-war in that kind of initial, you know, in the twenties. Um, and there, when you see photos of, of these people and, and they've, they've gone and they found the name, you know, and it's, it's to put a hand on a name. Like there's so much in a name. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one thing the Wargrave Commission did with these monuments is to imbue and, and give a focus to um, all of that grief and they imbued all that person into just some carving on some stone, you know, and, it, and that is a, an incredibly powerful thing. Um, and absolutely, I, I'm quite tactile. So whenever I go to the Meningay and places like that, I always find myself touching the walls. And, and and running my hand over the names it's a it's a it's instinctive actually and I always wonder how many other people have done that you know and has this person's relative whether it be their you know their grandchild or their child or their mother like who's been who's visited this person who's come to bear witness to their name it's it's just um yeah it, it's you can't really describe it actually it's very very difficult and I feel very very lucky that I've been able to um, visit these places because I know so many people, we've got a lot of viewers in the US, for example, and Canada, you know, don't get those opportunities. And it's um, that's why hopefully, you know, we try to bring this to life as much as possible for them. Definitely. And I'm exactly the same as you, Lucy. I'm, I'm very tactile. And um, when I used to do tours of, of the Meningate Memorial, I'd pop over and say hello and, and tell Thomas's story, um, which I found really quite poignant. And it didn't matter if I did that once or a hundred times, it would be that one time where it kind of got emotional. And it's something that I do a lot with um, school groups. And if you are taking school groups, obviously I know that you're experts in, in giving tours. Something that I found really poignant, particularly for younger audiences is them touching the name as well and just saying, you know, hello to whoever, because it makes it less, um, difficult for them to understand they're just looking at a name and, and understanding their story um, yeah, and if you 100%. Cemeteries, then they can feel like they're speaking to someone which is really yeah. nice and I think um actually Phil made a comment uh, complimented you earlier on on how you're doing such a, a fantastic job of bringing what could be and what what is it a very very sad and could be a very depressing subject to life but I think you know within this and actually within the commission's work there is something that's that's uplifting in it in a way because it's 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 that idea of no matter who you were no matter where you came from no matter what your background no matter what you did whether you served for a day or 10 years you are remembered and for me that actually is 
is a very positive thing. It mm -hmm. sounds weird, maybe. I don't know. No, no, I agree with you. And I, I will say as well, I, I know I keep apologising for different things, but when we talk about death and bereavement, I try to make it as uplifting as possible because I appreciate people who are in different circumstances. Um, but sometimes you find yourself saying things like favourite cemetery and stuff, and you're like, oh, this terminology is is difficult but it's true and you feel these connections and you want to say hello um, and I think it's just a reminder to everyone that grief is individual and as long as you're respectful then I think that's okay too. Yeah I agree. <laughs> uh, if we move on to the next slide Lucy because we're going to go back to the UK now. Now it was a few minutes ago now uh, that I mentioned to you about the scope of the work uh, in Europe and I asked you to highlight uh, the note for the UK based commemorations. So you can see there that there's over 305,000 commemorations in the UK. So that's names on memorials to the missing, but also cemeteries. And you'll see that that's actually a higher number than Belgium. Uh, and it's just lower than France. So France has the highest number of commemorations uh, globally that are cared for by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And then it's the UK. And this was something that really surprised me when I started researching into what would become my PhD, because we go and visit places like the Western Front and, and uh, Gallipoli Peninsula and places like that. Um, but we often forget that a lot of people died at home, too. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that and who they are and why they're here and give you a bit of a teaser on my thesis, um, as it were. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, Lucy, thank you. Um, so. <laughs> She, you're so on it tonight. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd give you some reasons why an individual could be commemorated in the UK. This isn't an exhaustive list. Um, again, for every rule, there's an exception. But generally speaking, they can be fitted into one of these categories. So having been injured or become ill overseas, uh, individuals might have been sent back to the UK where they later died of wounds or their illnesses. Um, they might have died during training accidents that were occurring in Britain. So, for example, uh, a lot of air casualties happen in training accidents. Um, I always uh, make the comment to people when I'm taking them around Cranwell St Andrews Churchyard that a lot of those individuals uh, died on the runway that's just up the road, um, which sometimes scares them a little bit. Um, but it's an interesting point. Uh, they might have died in accidents more generally. So, for example, whilst they're on leave uh, and there are many examples of this as well uh, people might have been killed in the air or at sea um, during battles with their remains either lost and therefore being commemorated on a memorial at their home port usually or their remains were later washed ashore and then they have a headstone and the final point is a slightly controversial one of they were repatriated and again i'm not going to create a controversial point here but i'm going to highlight an example later on but I just want you to remember for every rule, there's an exception. I know that there was a repatriation ban for the British Empire forces in force from 1915, but there are some exceptions of how they came to be. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, Lucy, thank you. I just wanted to show you an example of a UK based site. Um, so this is a local war memorial to me. So I live just outside of Nottingham and this is Tolerton War Memorial. Um, and among the people on this uh, local war memorial is Gunnar Sweet. And he was from Tolerton. He worked at the local manor house. His family were from there. And he is remembered in the local churchyard, which is St. Peter's churchyard. And I think he's the only war grave that's in that site, if I remember correctly. But as you can see, it doesn't look like a commissioned headstone in terms of that sort of cream white Portland that we're used to seeing usually. It's something called a private memorial. And you've got to imagine this is what people were arguing for along places like the former Western Front. It's not something that you would notice that compared to other graves within the site. It's a name within a family grave. Uh, and unless you knew what you were looking for, you might overlook it. Um, and also we need to remember that a lot of people wanted to publicly grieve. So on the War Memorial, it might be on Armistice Day, that's where everyone went to because it remembers everyone from Tolerton who died. Whereas for Gunnar Sweet's family, that's a very private place to grieve. And I think that that's really interesting as well uh, and just highlights the uniqueness of the UK in particular. Again, these can happen in other places, but I wanted to show you what you might see in a, a commission site in the UK. Yeah, I mean, I, these little private memorials, they in pretty much every every cemetery in the UK, every church cemetery, if you look hard enough, you'll you'll find these things, don't you? It's uh, it's amazing. And I just a quick question that's just come about. 
<clears throat> are there any tributes to animals within any of these uh, the cemeteries? So I'm going to I'm going to grab that one, Megan. Please um, do. <laughs> uh, there, there are there are indeed, um, but not official war grave um, animal graves. Um, but there are uh, private memorials, just because this is um, what Megan's talking about right now. But there are some to horses, um, and actually. Isn't there a second war one that mentions a dog? I'm pretty sure there is. A... Yes. yes. Tell us and more about Megan. Rumors and things. I think it's in Normandy, but please do not quote me on that. Well, I'm sure I'm not lost enough. Please, <laughs> Woody, please do shout at me if I've given enough information there. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. So, yes, they are. They're, they're, they're definitely they're around, um, but um, certainly not officially. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and uh, Lisa, when you're talking about people cremated during to their, uh, due to their faith, uh, uh, I will come back to this a little bit later on. Um, but they are on memorials to the missing usually. But I've also got an example of a UK based one coming up. So again, keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, <laughs> and if we move on to the next slide, Lucy, I just want to show some examples. So as we mentioned, the commission comes into existence in 1917. Families are already burying people by this point if they're in the UK. Um, and so you're having to negotiate. Families might not want to exhume their war dead, so we have to work around that, which I'll show you a bit later. But some people uh, and some cemetery authorities set aside land for the First World War dead. This becomes a lot more commonplace in the Second World War. So you might find in a site that there's over 100 burials for the First World War that are scattered throughout a larger site, whereas the Second World War is in a set plot. Uh, and this is because basically they learn from what happens with First World War commemoration. And I wanted to highlight some examples where this happened for First World War dead, and particularly the image on the left, um, just because it's, again, closer to home. Um, this is Greenwich Cemetery, which is, if you know the Woolwich area, it's just the other side of Shooter's Hill, uh, right next to the Royal Military Academy and, and Woolwich Barracks and, and that sort of area. And it's behind the Royal Herbert Hospital. Uh, and this was an area of land set aside for First World War dead because it was near to the Herbert Hospital. Um, and it's an example of them thinking they've got quite a large number of war dead coming in that they need to commemorate somewhere. Where do they put them? And they put them here. Um, and that shows some of the types of work you may see. You may see larger sites like Brookwood Military Cemetery, which is the largest site in the UK. Um, and a shout out to that wonderful team down there as well, because I've just worked with them this week. <laughs> but also it could be down to the scattered graves um, as well, of which around 90% of the sites in the UK have 10 or fewer burials. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, Lucy, we've got some examples of that. Um, so these are some examples of scattered graves and memorials. So I'm going to just talk about from left to right and then give some detail in between. So on the left, you've got a curb with a headstone in front. If that had done, been done in more recent years, it would look more like the Gallipoli pedestal markers that you see out on the Gallipoli Peninsula. And that's just because the foundation for that stone is slightly shorter. And we've got to remember that some of these graves are family graves with uh, multiple occupants in. And what you may see is if a name becomes illegible and is seen to be that way by the commission, you may put in a, a headstone to commemorate them because you have to commemorate by name in perpetuity. So in all likelihood, that graves uh, on the curb edge might have no longer be able to read uh, the name. So that's why that headstone has been put in there. Then in the middle, we've got an example of another private memorial. Uh, and again, air power historians might be particularly interested in this one. This is down in Chatham, uh, just past uh, Brompton Barracks at Maidstone Road Cemetery. And uh, this is for the McCudden family. Now, if you recognise the McCudden name, it's because one of the sons, uh, James McCudden, was a flying ace. Um, and he and his brothers are all remembered on here, but only one brother is actually physically in the grave. And we see this a lot in the UK. They might mention people who are buried overseas because obviously the families aren't there that often. Uh, and the eldest brother, um, who is believed to have been an inspiration for, for James, uh, the guy's name is Bill, uh, is buried in that site there. And he actually died in a training accident at Gosport. Um, but all four brothers, like I say, are remembered here. And I think the father as well. But it's an example of a headstone that you wouldn't necessarily recognise as a war grave either. Um, and then on the right hand side, we've got a, an example of it, what's known as a quadruple headstone. And if you've never seen it before, it's OK. You've not missed out. Uh, it's only available in two places worldwide. Uh, one of them is at Newport in Wales and the other one is in this image. And there's quite a few of them there. And that's Nottingham General Cemetery, which is just outside of Nottingham City Centre. 
And again, these are adapting to the needs of a particular site. Um, so the, in this particular location, a lot of the military hospitals were in and around Nottingham. And these were individuals um, who were all buried in the same multiple occupancy grave. And because they're not missing, we know where to commemorate them. But how do you commemorate a multiple occupancy grave? You create a quadruple headstone like this. And I was really privileged to be able to see this installed. And when I say that the staff um, who worked there, again, shout out to that team, Lee and Andy in particular, who were installing it, it was such a job to do. And uh, it was incredible to see the craftsmanship that goes into that. It's not just stuff for headstone in, it's aligning it with other things and all of that sort of stuff. So these are some examples of the types of things that you can see. Um, just a quick question um, that's come in from James there, Megan. Um, how were these produced? These How were they all produced to be you know, so similar, almost identical? They were actually produced by hand with um, specialist engravers. And Lucy, I know you wrote an article or two where you've got an image, a really famous image of the Canadian uh, headstone being engraved by someone, didn't you? Yeah, I did, <laughs> yeah. It was like a while ago. And you can visit, can't you, if, if you're lucky enough to, to head, be able to head over to France, you can now visit the CWC, right, and see a bit of, but behind the scenes of how this is done. Yes, exactly. So it's all done by machines largely now, but we do have stonemasons and uh, master craftsmen who do engraving for upkeeping and things like that. And again, if you follow them on social media, some of the work that they do, um, I think uh, one of the, the chaps that comes up quite often for me is called Nader, and uh, he's out in uh, Palestine, and he highlights some of the work that he does. And it's honestly incredible how he can make stone come to life for want of a better word yeah what a craft it's it's an amazing skill and as you say yeah I mean it's amazing that the War Growth Commission still use a mixture of machine and and this hand craft to keep that alive I suppose you know yeah and in the UK perspective as well a lot of the time they use local um, masons um, certainly so it helped with the economy after the first world war and I'm pretty sure they did that overseas as well um, so again it's just so many interesting um, items um, and then, Lisa, if you remember your question about cremations on the next slide, uh, has the answer for you, <laughs> which uh, is a screen wall. And uh, the image on the left is from Leicester Gilrow Cemetery in Leicestershire. Uh, there's a number of different reasons why there are screen walls. Um, so it can be a case of a large number of war dead can't be commemorated for a variety of reasons. So they're put on a screen wall. For example, in Gravesend Cemetery, there's um, an example of that. Um, and in this particular case, it's because a large number of uh, individuals from the Second World War wanted to be cremated. And so they were cremated actually in what is now that modern day crematorium behind you. I don't think it was the same one at the time behind the, the, the screen wall. And it's basically like a smaller memorial to the missing in many ways. Um, so do keep an eye out for these, particularly in places that are affiliated to municipal cemeteries and crematoriums today, because there's usually one there and it will highlight why that individual's uh, those individuals don't have a known grave. Um, we just had a few questions about the uh, the material, the old Portland stone. It's not just Portland stone, is it, Megan? Tell yeah. us a little bit about about what these um, memorials are made of. Uh, I will apologise at this point to any of my works colleagues who are in the chat um, and feel free to correct me, but there are over 30 types of stone that are used. Um, so depending on where you are in the UK, certainly, you can see local stone being used. Um, in where I am in East Midlands, they often use Stancliffe, which is a brownish uh, redstone. Uh, in Scotland, you may see granite. Uh, but the most common type of headstone that you will probably be familiar with is that Portland cream white stone. Um, but there's, you know, a variety of stones being used. In the UK perspective, it's often designed based on how it will weather. So obviously Scotland is a very large country um, and granite is... Uh, local to there and also withstands that Scottish weather. Um, yeah, well. Port Portland stone might not do so well up on the Isles. No, and if you want to see some examples of that, um, I think it's down at Brookwood Military Cemetery again. They show examples of uh, former coastal memorials to the missing, um, which is very uh, fascinating and highlights that weathering of, of the poor Portland stone yeah. on the coast. Um, and then on the right hand side is an example of an alternative commemoration. Sometimes this is known as a special memorial or a Kipling memorial. Um, and this one particularly is in Erith Brook Street Cemetery in Kent. Um, and this is exactly what it's like on the former battlefields where there was a known grave, um, but 
it's not available. You can't access it now for a variety of reasons. It could be that that grave is now lost. Um, it could be that you know a variety of details. So what they'll put at the top is something like believed to be buried in this cemetery, known to be buried, and such like. And we also see that in the UK. Um, so I wanted to highlight the connections to the battlefields as well. Uh, and then if we move on to this one, and the reason why I highlight this is this shows how it changes over time in the UK. Um, so sometimes churchyards become repurposed um, and sites may become what's known as unmaintainable. So what do you do with the war dead that you've um, believed to be in perpetuity? And Stuart, I know it's now in South East London as well. It's part of the Greater London, uh, which is Erith, the London Borough of Bexley. Uh, so thank you for correcting me there. Um, and this is an example here in East Ham. Um, and this includes the name of mechanician Burma and his records are in an uh, e-file or an inquiries file where the family talk about his headstone being so unmaintainable and there's a conversation about where to commemorate them so sometimes there's alternative commemorations in nearby cemeteries um, as well um, and so this is an example that you may see and it will highlight where they were originally buried uh, and then finally to round off on my last slide I want to show an example um, of a repatriation. Now, I remember saying that this was not a controversial thing that I was going to talk about, uh, and I know it goes against um, the um, idea of non-repatriation from 1915, um, but I wanted to highlight there are some people that come back to the United Kingdom, um, sometimes illicitly, sometimes legally, pre-1915, but uh, Lieutenant Austin is one that happens after the 1915 ban. Now, Vernon James Austin was the son of uh, an heir of the Austin Motor Company, which is based out of Birmingham. And he served in the First World War and is actually killed in uh, La Basse uh, in late January of 1915. So right around the time of the repatriation ban. And uh, in the inquiries files that you can access for free on the website of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, um, there's details where the biographer for uh, Lieutenant Austin's father is asking whether um, there's any truth in this belief that there was a rumour that Lieutenant Austin's remains was repatriated to the UK illicitly in a box of spare car parts to Folkestone. There are no details either way whether that's true or not, but it's a way that some people might have chosen to attempt to illicitly repatriate. Um, and I think it's a really interesting aspect of commemoration, you know, particularly the wealthy wanted uh, to repatriate their loved ones and some would do things uh, in an illegal way. But however, Lieutenant Austin came to the UK, he is uh, given a funeral in Canterbury in Kent and he's now buried in St Martin's Churchyard, which is uh, next to the King's School at Canterbury. Uh, and these images really surprised me when I viewed them for the first time, because for about 18 months, I was studying my PhD in COVID. And um, I just thought it would be very, very quiet um, and low key affair. You know, you don't want to draw attention to doing something potentially illegally. And then I see four military honours down Canterbury High Street, which Stuart has highlighted he was walking down yesterday because um, he's from uh, East Kent as well. So hi, Stuart. Um, but uh, yeah, it's four military honours. He's put on the back of a gun carriage and the local regiment parades through the high street of Funeral March. And in the King's School Canterbury's archival records, there's a newspaper clipping which highlights that he was laying state in one of the chapels for Canterbury Cathedral. He's given, you know, basically... I see it as almost like a state funeral in terms of how I'm visualising it. Um, and it's a really interesting thing. And we can see on the right hand side, particularly where you've got the, the individuals carrying their rifles um, downwards um, as part of the morning march, that people on the high street are watching on. They're not necessarily arguing and critiquing. They're just watching this funeral happen. And there are 60 known repatriations or around 60 known. Most of them are from an officer class. Most of them are from France and Belgium to the UK, and most of them are on the coast. Like I say, this is an exception rather than the rule, and the Commission did not allow it. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that these are some really interesting examples of what you can find out from just yeah. doing some digging. That's fascinating. Um, I mean, I, as well, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I'm sure you are. Um, uh, Richard Van Emden's book, Missing, um, mm an incredible story about one mother and her kind of quest to bring her son back um and it's 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 fascinating it kind of highlights all the things that you've um that you've spoken about in terms of how people dealt with loss and this controversy around 
you know, whether people could bring their loved ones back to grieve in their own way rather than what was being, as they viewed, forced upon them by the commission. Exactly. And I think it's it's really interesting. I'm just looking in a, a the chat as well and I will get onto that question about Iraq in, in just a second um, but it's it's a really interesting point that you know people are commemorating in different ways and they're determined to bring them back and there's lots of things going on but we also need to remember again commemoration now versus commemoration at the time might have been very different and attitudes towards death and bereavement have really changed over the last century I'd argue in the western world um, and you know potentially these people in the high street might have expected it from uh, Lieutenant Austin because of who he was and I should highlight at this point I didn't quite explain why he's buried in Canterbury as opposed to Birmingham which is where he's from um, and there's a, a, a legend shall we say uh, to round off the evening with a legend that uh, him and his friends who all attended the King's School in Canterbury made an agreement uh, when they were about to sign up for the First World War um, to fight in the First World War that they if they died they'd like to be buried in their old boys churchyard so that might be true, that might not be true. Um, but I wanted to highlight that connection again of, it sounds quite morbid to be talking about death, I suppose, in your early twenties and teenage years. I feel like it's the kind of thing you would, I, I can see that mm. though. I can see these, you know, especially when people did take on this bit of a fatalistic attitude as, you know, it became almost like a blase thing to talk about that. You know, that's the, the sad reality of it. So yeah, I can, I can, I can believe that I think, yeah. Yeah, and Stuart's, sorry, Stuart's uh, really popping up in the chat, and I really appreciate it, because I didn't know this, that King's School was Monty's old school, which I didn't know, so we're connecting it there to the Second World War again. Um, <laughs> um, but going back to, I'm just going to scroll up in the, the chat to the question about Iraq, because it... it just, oh, yeah, I can bring that up for you. Thank you. Um, there you go. Thank you. Hi, Ian. Thank you for your question. Uh, so the graves in uh, Persia and modern day Iraq, uh, in terms of the recent wars, um, they were initially alternatively commemorated. Um, so if there is a conflict, we will try to remove the operational staff that are based out there and we will alternatively commemorate. In the case of Iraq, that was in some leather bound books that were held in he the commission's head office in Maidenhead. But in recent uh, years, as the conflict has kind of changed, um, we, um, as the Commission, actually went back into Iraq and they're starting to do some work there, uh, speaking with local contractors and all of that sort of thing as well. So they are getting there. They're not to necessarily um, site other sites you may expect, but remember, they've just come out of being a war zone. And do follow the uh, Asia, Africa and uh, area team on social media because the work they do is absolutely uh, fascinating. I think that the, their director is uh, out in Africa at the moment and highlighting a lot of things. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, perhaps a, a you know some kind of controversial topics there with the Wargrave Commission as well, which are mm. you know quite. I guess again, this is all about um, evolution. You know, this is a, a attitudes, concepts, views, perspectives have changed, and the Wargrave Commission has to adapt to that and that's got to be a constant journey so that's a that's a complex thing um there's a few questions that have, have come in Megan um just got a couple here so the, I know you covered this um, when you very first started about the funding and obviously we know that the Commonwealth nations contribute to the funding for the Wargrove Commission is there any other sources of funding as well um, usually it's just those uh, six member governments for funding. Um, in terms of agency work, which I kind of didn't touch upon because it's slightly more complicated. So they do some contractual work um, with other elements. Um, so, for example, Ministry of Defence Graves, some of those are in the Commission's care now. Um, that may come from those relevant funders as well. Um, but I think the budget a few years ago was about £60 million and that's spread out across the six member governments according to that percentage. Okay. Amazing. And another question. Um, Scott mentioned, um, it was a while back in the chat, that um, he'd seen a Wargrave Commission um, stone for a US serviceman. Um, can you speak to that? This is, again, one of those, it's a rule, but there's always an exception, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, again, that's actually part of our agency work. So thank you, Scott, for, for highlighting that. So certain... Uh, 
you might you might find foreign national graves or international graves. So particularly for the Second World War, War Dead near me in Nottinghamshire, a lot of them are Polish, which again, if you've done uh, looked at World War One TV, I think Jenny Grant was on there recently-ish. So do check that out. Um, and that's an agency work. So they work with the recognised government um, and they will talk about how they're going to maintain it, who's going to cover costs. Um, so, for example, at Heincourt, there are four German uh, individuals that are remembered there. Only one is known. Um, and again, that's a reciprocal arrangement with the German government. Um, but the US individual uh, might likely uh, be very similar to the one that's also near to me-ish in Lincolnshire, um, where he was serving with, uh, he was attached to the Royal Air Force, um, I think it was. And uh, he's got a, a, an ABMC grave, so that's an American Battlefields Monument Commission grave. Um, but I believe it's looked after by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Um, and again, they look exactly like they do in the Saving Private Ryan films uh, and that sort of thing. And you can also find a number of American cemeteries adjacent to commission sites. So I mentioned Brookwood uh, earlier this evening, Brookwood Military Cemetery in Surrey, uh, which is a fascinating site. Uh, and you've got the American Cemetery right next door. Um, as well and in Cambridge the Cambridge uh, American Cemetery and the uh, Cambridge City Cemetery are about five minutes drive from each other. Amazing thank you um, and well so we've got another question here so this is an interesting one um, oftentimes when we see the headstones there's some information on others not what was how, how did that work what did the how did the Wargrave Commission you know decide what to put on or find out what to put on? So it's based on what they actually find on the uh, set of remains. Um, so I don't know uh, what percentage of totally unknown, but again, I can ask and, and see if that's a statistic that is available. Um, but I've seen, for example, just this week, again, not to keep talking about Brookwood Military Cemetery, but in that site, there is an unknown squadron leader uh, from the Royal Air Force who was found, I think it was the 25th of August 1942. So it could have that much information on it, but still be an unknown. Um, so what they look at is the soldiers' effects. So what's found on their body, uh, what's found on their boots, what personal items they have, what can be identifiable. Um, and it could be that you find that they've got an Irish regiment um, or they've got a corporal rank side. And they also think about this logically as well. If it's something that's potentially found in the pocket area, it might not actually belong to them. It might be a, a souvenir that they found. So you've got to think about that as well. Um, and so they might be only identifiable by their regimental badge. They might only be identifiable by their rank. Um, and so it's a really interesting thing to see these unknowns that are, have more known about them, but not enough to definitively say who they are. And yeah. if there's even just two options, they will still put that as an unknown because they don't want to misidentify. I'm thinking of one particularly controversial case when it comes to this is, uh, of course, Rudyard Kipling's son. Yes. Which, um, for those who don't know... Well, I'll let you find out for yourself by doing a bit of uh, research online. But John Kipling, you know, his, his grave was initially, I think, unknown and then it was known. And then there was questions about whether it was actually him. It's, it's a whole thing, but it's one of those things that really highlights how difficult it is for the commission uh, today, you know, was and is still um, when it comes to what is enough evidence, you know, we don't necessarily want to leave a grave as unnamed if there's a potential that they you know, know who it is. But at the same time, of course, you don't want to misattribute something. So it's a very, very difficult, I think, uh, area. Yes, definitely. Um, and I can see that lots of people are talking about that as well. And uh, Shell Drake um, has put down about the Canadian unknown soldier uh, that was selected in 1999. And looking at the selection of the un unknown warriors for various countries is a really interesting topic to look at as well. So sorry, I've not covered so much. This is just literally the tip of the iceberg with the work. No, I mean, we'll have to get you back. Man, and it's such a, it's such a huge <laughs> thing, the War Grave Commission. There's so many different angles to it. Um, just while we're on this topic, um, and Ian's asked, you know, is DNA taken from all individuals? I'm going to, I'm going to give that one to you to, to answer. <laughs> um, no. Um, but sometimes, again, for every rule, there is an exception. And again, my if commemorations teams are in the comments, please do feel free to correct me. They wouldn't necessarily take DNA because think of the passage of time. Also, there's not a DNA database that has everyone's DNA on. Uh, and then that's kind of a, a murky area to go on. Um, but 
in some cases that may be used but that's exceptional rather than the rule usually yeah. it's soldiers effects and things like that um, and here's a question from Scott. Um, was cost a factor for not returning the dead to various countries covered by the CWGC? Partly yes, but also remember it's a hygienic thing. It's, it's not being flown home. Uh, it may be sailed to Australia, which may take six months. And that's why the repatriation ban uh, came in, really. It's that logistical uh, issue of trying to bring people home, but also that uh, idea of hygiene, you know, bringing back uh, remains that have potentially been uh, in quite catastrophic circumstances that have been laid in the battlefields for a number of months is quite unhygienic. Um, but I imagine that cost was also a factor and other countries didn't necessarily follow that. Um, and it, it's just a case of that was what the British Empire forces went with. Yeah, and I think, you know, cost is a plays a big part in all of this because, you know, again, one of the reasons the the Wargrave Commission went with this idea that they would ban all repatriations was, of course, because some people, as you said earlier, some people would be able to afford to bring their loved ones back. Some wouldn't. Um, and same thing with the headstones being uniform. You can you can well imagine when you see these, you go to any kind of church cemetery anywhere, you know, some people have more extravagant headstones and grave markers than others. And that that's what would happen. You'd end up with like pauper's graves, essentially, wouldn't you, on the Western Front or wherever? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's it's really interesting uh, looking at the comments about, uh, for example, Terry's mentioned about the Fromel dig, which for those of you that don't know, Fromel was one of the first new cemeteries in I think about 50 years um, that the commission created in 2009 because there was such a high proportion of Australian casualties that were found or war dead that were found in a particular site um, and so that's why that was created. Yeah amazing well Megan thank you so much for this evening it's been absolutely fascinating um, yeah I mean so many questions once again we're finishing a show with more questions than when we began which is what I like it means we've had a great show um is there anything you know for you with your work um at the Wargraves Commission is there anything like what's your big takeaway what sort do you want to leave people watching this who you know we've got many viewers who are abroad and don't know anything about the Wargraves what would you suggest they do next if they want to find out more I think go and visit as simple as it sounds there is a free app that you can look at all war graves uh, within a 10 mile radius near you. Uh, apologies if there aren't any near you, but you may find some when you're on holiday. And just go and visit the sites and kind of get to know them and what the layout is and what to expect and look at the names and say hello to them, like we said, uh, and look at their stories um, if you can as well. Um, and also just that I think someone mentioned in the chat that there's some free talks and tours coming up, certainly in the UK uh, for Heritage Open Days um, and things like that. So do look at the Commission website for some of those free events that they're doing. But yeah, just be in the cemeteries and, and get to know them because I think they're really interesting to look at. And that's the purpose of it all, ultimately, isn't it? Yes. Amazing. Thank you, Megan. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> and hope, hope you can join us again sometime soon. Thanks very much. Right, everybody, um, I am going to remember because somebody, Norma mentioned it earlier, don't forget to like and subscribe. Look at that. Um, we are just scheduling some more shows. There's nothing up at the moment, but we're working on it. So we've got um, um, some great guests lined up and I'm looking forward to bringing you those in due course. So keep an eye on things. Um, yeah, amazing. Had a great evening. Have a great day wherever you are. And um, thank you for joining us. And as ever, thank you for all your support. I really, really do appreciate it. See you again soon.